Do you, are you hooked up? No. Oh. Is that on? Is that on? Okay. Can everybody hear me? Okay. So, Ken, thanks a lot for inviting me, and I'm very, very pleased to be here. I really enjoyed the morning. Uh, your talk, Sandy, was great, and, and the other ones that followed as well. Uh, and I think this is a, a very important meeting. I know it's an important meeting for you, you all in Missouri. I'm practicing my Texan. Um, and uh, what really impresses me is, is the human research here, which uh, at University of Texas I'm trying to foster connections between a very robust uh, preclinical research group in the Wagner Center uh, for Alcohol and Addiction Research with a very robust research in the social sciences in the, uh, the School of Social Work and also in the psychology department. And you know it's a big university, 53,000 students, lots of faculty, and it's amazing how people don't talk to each other. So I'm trying to build this center as a more inclusive ecosystem for use of a business term, which I don't like, but I used it. Uh, I guess I've been in administration too long. All right, so I'm going to talk to you today about drugs for alcohol use disorder. And it's, a, it's an interest of mine that's gone on for many years. So I, I, I show this slide just to start off to tell you that alcohol use disorder is the most prevalent use disorder and still remains the most prevalent use disorder even with the opioid toxic crisis that we have. And will probably remain so into the future worldwide. Um, that being the case, it's, uh, it, it also is the most expensive single use disorder uh, next to smoking. And, um, and drug abuse as a whole is, uh, is, thir is sort of uh, secondary to it. When you break it out into individual drugs, they're all dwarfed by these two. What's interesting is that the funding models don't necessarily follow these numbers. So NIDA, which encompasses all of these, gets about twice the uh, amount of dollars in its budget compared with the NIAAA, even though this is a much bigger problem. And unfortunately, smoking doesn't really have a home. It's sort of scattered amongst multiple institutes, a lot of it being uh, cancer-based research funded by NCI. So we don't necessarily, you know, in an economic and social sense, deal with our problems equitably where we put our monies. So that's my plug for the NIAAA. Um, so one thing I want to mention is that alcohol and other substance use disorders have about a 40 to 50% risk, uh, genetic risk. So this is a setup for the next speaker. Um, and uh, you know that most of the data for alcohol is actually in males, but it's about a 50% of the variance is a genetic risk. And here's a, a family tree over here where this is the uh, paternal side of the family and there's no history of alcohol use disorder. The maternal side, not a lot of history about what was going on in the parent, in the grandparents, but uh, the grandmother was known to be kind of a difficult human being. Um, there were uh, three siblings who had alcohol use disorder. One died during training in World War II. Another one wound up on the streets and was never heard of. And the third one became a mother to uh, three siblings, one of whom uh, the mother and the daughter suffered terribly from depression. And the, uh, the brother, the older brother here, um, was uh, uh, quite aware that he could drink anybody under the table. So he was a very low responder to alcohol. And the other person over here would fall asleep just like the father and many of the siblings with one drink. Uh, so this is my family tree. <clears throat> and I'm sure several of you have family members or know of a close friend with multiple family members who have suffered from the problem because it's common. Uh, how do genes influence risk of alcohol use disorder? Well, they can uh, change the, uh, the psychopharmacology. So, like I told you, my brother knows he can drink anybody under the table and made a conscious decision just not to drink. But he has innate tolerance or acute, you know, uh, enhanced uh, insensitivity, I guess, to alcohol. Um, and that, that seems to be an inherited trait. What hasn't been really uh, investigated as much is the opposite, which I actually inherited from my father. I'm, my father was known as One Drink Willie. He'd go to somebody's house and he'd start snoring after one drink. 
Um, there are personality types, which has been mentioned, you know, risky behavior, sensation seeking, uh, extroverts, uh, you know, the frat boys, that sort of thing. Uh, people who are impulsive and will be uh, subject to peer pressure and dares to, to drink and chug beers, et cetera. Et cetera. There's psychopathology associated with high risk, in particular depression and bipolar disorder as a prime example, but also antisocial uh, personality and externalizing personality disorders. And then finally, there, there's a physiologic uh, uh, genetics that actually, for the most part, prevent people from developing alcohol use disorder. And the most uh, robust genetic variant that does this are in these two enzymes, alcohol dehydrogenase and acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. High activity ADH leads to an increased production of acetaldehyde, as does uh, a nearly inactive or null version of this uh, ALDH2 enzyme. And this compound, when it builds up, causes uh, flushing, uh, fast heart rate, nausea, headache. A at very low doses, it's, it's thought to be quite rewarding, actually, if you, if you, you know, do questionnaires on people. They say they just drink a little bit and it does them really well. They drink a little too much, they feel sick. And this is a negative, very, very much a negative risk factor for alcohol use disorder. The other genetics, though, is not. I mean, most of the other gene variants, they have very small effect sizes, and they're kind of hard to track through populations. Um, not only are humans uh, carriers of variants that confer risk or lack of risk, mice and other rodents do as well. And you can look at inbred mouse strains and put them in a two-bottle choice drinking uh, uh, procedure where they can drink either water or an alcohol-containing solution and measure how much they drink. One person has already mentioned C57 black 6J mice, which are lushes. They drink like crazy. And down here, people have used as, a, as an extreme uh, different uh, strain, DBA2J mice, which don't like to drink at all. And people have done cro crosses of these inbred lines and tried to track genes through the uh, interbred uh, recombinant lines, inbred lines. <clears throat> now, in addition to there being a genetics for risk, uh, there also is the fact that drugs change the brain, and alcohol, like other drugs of abuse with repeated use, cause the nervous system to actually try to adapt to the presence of the drug, and in those adaptations, which I would call maladaptations, there's some sort of a feed-forward mechanism that occurs which promotes further drug use. So this has been um, sort of graphically illustrated in two ways. One is a linear model um, where, uh, and this was talked about already in one of the short talks, where liking and the intoxication phase of the drug with repeated use goes to actually wanting the drug. It's kind of an ab aberrant memory response. You also develop tolerance to the uh, pleasurable effects of the drug, so you have to use more of it to get, to get the pleasure. And then eventually you get dependence, and there's a shift to being uh, unhappy when you don't have the drug. So you actually you go from liking to wanting to needing the drug just to feel normal. And that occurs particularly with alcohol and with opiates. Um, it, it's been put in a cycle here by George Koob and others. Uh, it's called the uh, addiction cycle, where you have a binge intoxication phase that gives way to, as the pe people become dependent, to a reward deficit and stress surfeit uh, condition known as this uh, negative affect withdrawal phase where you need the drug to even feel normal. And eventually, alcohol damages the brain and you lose executive function, you get deficits of judgment. And these have been mapped to different circuits and different brain regions and some different neuropeptides and neurotransmitters. So uh, drugs change the brain and there is, there is some risk and individual differences as to how dramatically they do change the brain. And there also is a variation on which one of these kind of behavioral phenotypes drives the uh, desire to drink amongst different people. So there are some people who will tell you that they just love to drink because they love the feeling of being intoxicated. Uh, there was a Bill Moyers television series many years ago, maybe 20 years ago, on addiction. And I remember him interviewing one guy who was a, uh, a sober alcoholic who said that just a drink will just make him feel fantastic. Those people tend to get excited by alcohol. They, they tend to uh, have a pretty high tolerance innately, and they just go for this binge intoxication phase in college kids who are relatively resistant to the uh, 
sedative effects will do this. They're known as reward drinkers. And at the other extreme, people who uh, don't feel good at all without the drink, those are relief drinkers. Generally, these are younger people. Generally, these are older people. And there's a spectrum in between. And it's worthwhile remembering just this behavioral phenotype categorization, because I'll get to it with, with personalizing medication therapy. So the mainstay of therapy, because the drugs aren't great, and I'll get into that in a minute, the mainstay has been behavioral therapy. So this is very different than opioid addiction, where you know, the drugs actually can replace the, uh, the addiction pretty well, and you can maintain people on very specific opioid agonists or partial agonists. So for alcohol use disorder, behavioral therapy is the mainstay. And probably the most successful are cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interviewing. And we have somebody at UT Austin, uh, Mary Velasquez, who has been a big proponent of this and has published on this. Um, there is medication-assisted therapy for alcohol use disorder, and it truly is assisted therapy here rather than primary. And the traditional routes to discovering these drugs have either been just by accident or some knowledge and some deductive reasoning about the pharma known pharmacology of alcohol and a drug that might mimic that, or by accident discovering that people on psychotropic drugs actually are a little bit better in their drinking, and so they're tried in, in, in other alcoholic, uh, other patients with alcohol use disorder who don't necessarily have that psychiatric disorder. So there are three FDA-approved drugs, disulfuran, naltrexone, and encamprosate, and then a few effective off, but off-label drugs, and then some drugs that have been talked about a lot more recently, but it's uncertain as to whether they're effective. And I'm just going to go through these. Uh, I realize the talk says new therapies, but I think I need to review the old. So disulfuran was found in the, uh, in the early 40s quite by accident amongst workers making uh, synthetic rubber that when they went to the bar after, after work in, in Denmark, they, uh, they found that they were, got sick if they drank. And uh, Danish chemists then uh, 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 isolated the active compound, and it was this disulfuram. Uh, and what it does is if you take it and you drink, you feel sick. And so what the, the mechanism of action is it reduces uh, drinking by fear of punishment if you do drink. And what it does is it inhibits alcohol, aldehyde dehydrogenase, which I had shown you in a previous slide, with the negative, with the green uh, frowny face. Um, it, uh, it has been reviewed uh, recently in a, in a paper in JAMA, and I would recommend this paper. This is a very good meta-analysis of multiple drugs uh, for alcohol use disorder. And it actually, uh, when looked across two trials with almost 500 people, it really didn't have a significant difference in outcome uh, for return to any drinking. And I think the problem is it doesn't target any of the core phenomena of the addiction cycle that I had shown you earlier. Uh, also, it has a problem in that if people drink a lot while they're on it, it can be fatal. So what happens is if they want to drink, they stop taking the drug, wait a day, and then they start drinking again. And uh, it may cause liver toxicity in some people. So it's not a great drug, probably would never get approved in this day and age by the FDA. Uh, now, Trexone is, is uh, probably the most widely used drug in the United States. It's an opioid receptor antagonist, and there is logic to using this for, uh, for blunting the rewarding effects of alcohol. There is good imaging evidence for endorphin release in the brain with alcohol, with, with either drinking or having an alcohol injection in humans. Um, it is therefore most effective in people who are actively drinking because it blunts the rewarding response to alcohol. And it seems to be uh, more effective in people with, uh, who are family, family history positive uh, if they have strong craving, in other words, the reward drinkers. And um, that led to some studies looking at, whoops, looking at its, uh, its use, particularly in genetic variants, and I'll talk about that later because of the family history positive uh, finding. Um, it, it does have some limitations in that it actually has a small effect size. So there have been many, many studies. And again, in this JAMA uh, review, the end value here is you know, almost 3,000 people. Uh, the risk difference was you know, almost 10%. So in other words, compared with placebo, 10% more people uh, had uh, a, re uh, a, a lower return to heavy drinking. And uh, the percent of uh, drinking days was 5% uh, less. So, I mean, five days less. So it has a modest effect. 
over a population study. Um, the problem is that it has a very limited duration of action and only has a one to two hour half-life. So some people actually take it if they're feeling craving and they'll take it before they go out in a social situation. Maybe that's its most effective use, but that's not what it's sanctioned for. Um, and it has some adverse effects. It has some hepatotoxicity and makes people feel kind of dysphoric and, and nausea and fatigued. So some people stop taking it because of that. The other major drug is acamprosate, which most of, the, most of its use is, is, I mean, it is used in the United States, but it's more popular in Europe. More of the trials that were originally done on it were positive in Europe. It's not known exactly how it works. Uh, most of the evidence favors that it interferes with signaling in the neurotransmitter glutamate through three or four different mechanisms. Uh, there is an increase in glutamate signaling in, in various brain regions in, during alcohol dependence. And so it's thought to blunt that. It's been approved to, to sustain abstinence in people who are abstinent already at the initiation of therapy. And it's a pretty safe drug. It's well tolerated, doesn't interact with a lot of other drugs that are used uh, for uh, uh, behavioral modification. Uh, it does have the side effect of diarrhea because you have to take a oops, you have to take a lot of it. The dose is uh, basically six tablets a day, each uh, 333 milligrams. So it's quite an osmotic, osmotic load on your gut. Uh, again, like naltrexone, it has a small effect size um, and uh, a, a very similar risk difference and a very similar number needed to treat to see an effect. And uh, the only contraindication is if you have severe renal impairment. But it's a pretty safe drug. Just not terribly effective. So people have gone to look for additional medications just because of these kind of crummy effect sizes. And the three that have uh, gotten the most attention are, are nal nalmathine, varenicline, and topiramate. Nalmathine is another opioid antagonist, but it, it has a little bit different mechanism in that it's a partial agonist at one of the opioid receptors, the kappa opioid receptor, which is thought to mediate some of the aversive properties of opiates. And so it may shift the valence of alcohol drinking uh, uh, a little bit towards an aversive state is the theory of that. Uh, it appears more effective than naltrexone in reducing drinking in rats that are dependent. Um, and, but it's, uh, it, its effect size is really no, not much better than naltrexone. In the few studies that have been done, it uh, does have a longer half-life than naltrexone. So if you wind up with side effects, there's a little bit more of a problem in that the drug's not going to go away as fast. The company that makes this uh, makes a tablet for use in Europe, but it, they're not going to go in front of the FDA. They have no plans to make, make it, it available in the US. It is available in an injectable form for opioid overdose, but not for, uh, not for alcohol use disorder. But you, know, you might see people in Europe coming with those tablets. People do take this when they feel craving before they go out in a social situation. Varenicline is a very interesting drug. It's a uh, partial agonist at several nicotinic receptors and is the most effective smoking cessation drug on the market right now. Uh, it was thought to maybe be effective for alcohol use disorder because the, there's a very high co-occurrence of both addictions. And, uh, and there are several candidate genes, uh, risk genes, that are touted to be risk genes for both addictions. It reduces ethanol consumption uh, in, in rodents. And so it's been tried in humans in a lot of small clinical trials which showed an, a, a modest effect. There have been two larger uh, randomized clinical trials. One uh, sanctioned by the NIAAA had 200 smokers and non-smokers, so it was both groups, with AUD. And it reduced the percentage of heavy drinking days with a, with a fairly decent effect size. Um, and then there's a more recent randomized trial run out of Yale. Stephanie O'Malley was the lead author. And it only reduced uh, the percentage of heavy drinking days in men, not in women, but there were only 39 women in that study. So I would not venture to say it's ineffective in women, but, uh, but it seems to be effective, in, maybe more effective in men. There are more studies ongoing. It does have some side effects in some people, but they're generally mild. And I think this is a promising drug uh, for, for uh, trying on patients, particularly if they're smokers. Uh, the, last, uh, the last one that's been touted a lot, um, particularly by the group at uh, Pencil University of Pennsylvania, is topiramate, or Topamax. And it's an anticonvulsant that has uh, several mechanisms of action, but two of them are is it enhances GABA-A receptor function and it inhibits glutamate receptor function. 
And that's very reminiscent of what alcohol acutely does as well. So it's, if you will, it's kind of an alcohol mimetic. It's like replacement therapy for alcohol use disorder. And it has a moderately decent effect size in several studies. Uh, again, this is the JAMA um, meta-analysis. Uh, and it, the problem with it is it has some limiting side effects. It causes paresthesia, taste abnormalities. Uh, it's a great weight loss drug. Uh, it makes you somewhat anorexic. So if you have obese patients who have alcohol use disorder, they might like this. But people get dizzy and they get tired. You know, it's like an anticonvulsant. It makes you a little bit dopey. But this is a promising drug, and there are variants on this that are being tested now clinically. Uh, and you may see more in this, in this realm. There are two drugs that have become popular, but it's not clear that they work. So one is baclofen, and there was a, a famous book by a French cardiologist that, where he had terrible alcohol use disorder. He started taking this drug uh, initially for alcohol withdrawal seizures and claimed it cured his alcoholism. And, um, and really went on a, on a, a very popular uh, uh, crusade, if you will, to try and get this approved as a drug for alcohol use disorder, and actually wound up being approved in France. But if you look at the clinical experience and all the clinical trials that have been done on it, uh, overall, you know, the Cochrane database had, just had a recent review of this. There was no difference in, from placebo in any of the measures. And actually, there was an evidence for increased number of drinks per drinking day. So I'm not so sure that this is a great drug. I've given this as a neurologist to patients for spasticity, which is what it's approved for in the US, and it almost invariably causes somnolence and vertigo. So people don't like it too much unless they really have to take it. Um, the other drug is a gabapentin. And uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure why this was even tried, because there initially wasn't really any animal model data to push for this. Um, but uh, it. It does re reduce neurotransmitter release by inhibition of certain types of calcium channels. That's thought to be how, how it acts. It's a drug that was initially developed as an anticonvulsant, as a GABA mimetic, but it doesn't act at GABA receptors. And then it was found to maybe inhibit pain transmission, so it's used for neuropathic pain. Um, and uh, there have been some randomized clinical trials and recent animal data the recent animal data out of a uh, uh, lab at UNC showed that it actually increased alcohol intake in rats, which isn't a very good sign. There was one study from Barbara Mason's group at Scripps in, in California that uh, used, uh, that looked at non-treatment seeking alcohol dependent persons. And uh, it found that uh, compared with placebo, it improved abstinence and also sleep. But a recent randomized clinical trial that was much longer and used an extended release form um, with a larger number of patients uh, run by the NIAAA, of which Barbara Mason was one of the investigators, didn't show any effect. So I don't know if it's the formulation, the patient population differences, or whatever. But it, I think the, the you know, I, I'm not so sure that this is going to be that effective. And again, this also makes people sleepy. So. Um, I would say that I would give the green light to naltrexone and acamprosate. I'd give a, probably a, potentially a bigger green light to varenicline and to pyramate, and somewhat to nalmethine, but you can't get it in this country. I would be reluctant to give patients disulfuram. You'd have to monitor them very carefully. They'd have to be very motivated. And I leave gabapentin and baclofen in the gray zone. So there clearly is a need for new drugs. And, uh, you know, serendipity is not the greatest way to go about things. Can one go about things logically? So traditionally in the drug development uh, world, people have identified drug targets, and they've gone after these drug targets uh, by understanding some of the biology and biochemistry of a disease state. And then they've developed very selective drugs against the target and then tried them in, in animal models and then go to humans. And people have been trying to do that. And I will show you one study that I'm involved in where I have done that approach. The other is to identify gene and gene networks um, that might be important. And that makes sense in a complex disease, which has uh, multiple genetic risk factors, but they all cause a very small, uh, you know, amount, they contribute a very small amount to the total variance of the genetic risk. <laughs> and also to a drug that causes very large changes in gene expression in the brain. So what are those genes? What families do they form into? What kind of networks? And can those networks be used to predict drugs? So that's what I'm going to talk about at the end of the talk. So 
individual drug targets. So I've spent the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years? How old am I? I don't know. We, we went through this last night. Kenny and I are born the same year. So um, candidate drug targets from, I, I did a lot of studies in cell culture, looking how cells adapt to the continued presence of ethanol. There was a group at the Gallus Center that studied flies, another group that studied uh, C. elegans uh, nematodes. Uh, people were doing RNA sequencing uh, to look at different genes that were expressed, and some of it was done in humans. And I would you know, mine all these data and come up with potential drug targets and knock them out in, in mice, look at the knockout mice for behavioral changes, and then try to map circuits and cell signaling. And so my lab you know, went through a good 12, maybe a couple more on this list of genes that we knocked out in animals and studied. And the one that really, there were two that kind of hit gold. Uh, one is the alpha-4 subunit of the nicotinic receptor, which I'm not going to talk to you about today. But this is a target for varenicline. And the other one is protein kinase C epsilon. So protein kinase C epsilon is a kinase, which is an enzyme that puts phosphorylation uh, moieties on proteins that are its substrates. It's a very charged part of the molecule. It changes the structure and can change the function of the substrate. So it's a signaling uh, kinase, and it's a uh, member of a large family. There's a subfamily of related uh, genes. There, there are nine of them. They form three groups. The, this group uh, has a lot of structural similarities and is activated by both calcium and a lipid that comes out of lipid signaling called diacylglycerol. This group, the novel PKCs, uh, are only activated by the lipid, and this other group, which is related structurally but has different means of activation, the typical PKCs are, are quite different. We've studied representatives from each of these three classes and found uh, that the epsilon PKC gene really had a ma major effect on alcohol-related behaviors. Um, we found that uh, these animals avoid alcohol. I mean, they, they really have conditioned place aversion to alcohol. They drink very little of it, and they have less so of a response, but a similar response to nicotine. Uh, they also have reduced anxiety-like behavior, and they show reduced hyperalgesia to either inflammatory or neuropathic pain insults. And so these are three very clinically useful phenotypes, and so we decided to go after this. I'm just showing you here the early, so here's a study from 1999. That's, this is one of the first uh, issues of Nature Neuroscience that had just come out. And uh, Clyde Hodge was in the Gallus Center at the time as an assistant professor. He did the behavioral work. You can see in red here, these knockout mice do not like to drink alcohol. This is a two-bottle choice test where you raise the concentration of alcohol in the water every four days. And the wild-type mice drink quite nicely uh, up to, you know, by the end here, up to six grams per kilogram per day. But the knockout mice, very little, and they don't get past much, much past about 11% preference for alcohol versus water. So this was probably at the time the most dramatic uh, alcohol aversion phenotype anybody had seen in a knockout mouse. So because of all the potential clinical utility of this drug target, we went after it to try and make compounds against it. So this is a compound that's sold by uh, Sigma. Uh, and it was developed against a different kinase called ROC1. And a company in Belgium had actually modified it by adding this, these structures over here and changing this ring to a benzene ring and tested it and said it was fairly selective against PKC epsilon. But they never did anything with it. It was an agri agricultural uh, pharmaceutical company, and they were getting into the medical business, but then they canceled that. So it's in the patent database, but they haven't done anything in humans. So what we did is we, we looked at this, and this is Mike Pleiss, who's a medicinal chemist, and Dan Wong, who was a, a very talented scientist in my lab at UCSF. And we modified the structure, replacing this ring here with a hexane ring, so basically the same compound. But this allowed us to get patent uh, protection around it, and we made a whole slew of compounds. These are two. This is a variant of this. And we tested it, and we found when we did, looked at representatives of the three families of PKCs that really only the novel PKCs were very sensitive to inhibition. And then when we looked within the novel PKC family, we found that epsilon PKC in black here was the most sensitive enzyme. So it's a, it's a relatively selective inhibitor of PKC epsilon. We've also scanned the entire kinome against this with a commercial uh, uh, source that will do this kind of screening. And this only appears to hit 11 kinases out of 400 in 
It's a fairly selective compound. Um, we've tested this in mice. These are C57 black six mice, which you can get to drink a heck of a lot of alcohol. And this is 16 to 18 grams per kilogram per day. You give it to them every other day, so they're kind of binge drinking. And you can get blood alcohol levels four hours after you hang the bottles that are up in the you know, legal intoxication range. So we don't let our mice drive after this. Um, and then if we give them uh, the compounds, uh, they actually drop their drinking by about 50% at a 40 milligram per kilogram dose. It only occurs in the wild type mice. If we use the mice that lack the gene for PKC epsilon, we don't see an effect. So it's selective against the drug target. So we're now taking these compounds, and I'm working with a chemist at UT San Antonio who's modifying them. These, unfortunately, still inhibit the original kinase ROC1 that I had mentioned that the, the initial uh, you know, Y compound was against. If you inhibit ROC1, you can cause hypotension. This will never become a drug. Um, and we think we can change the structure and eliminate the ROC1 inhibition. So that's what we're working on. That's a, a grant funded by the Harrington Discovery Institute and also by uh, the DOD. And our hope is to make not only an alcohol, a drug against alcohol use disorder, but also a chronic pain drug. That's not a non-opioid chronic pain drug. But that's a very difficult task. I mean, maybe one out of 50 compounds that come out of an academic lab that look promising in preclinical studies make it all the way through this valley of death to actually being used at the bedside after all of the clinical trials. It's a very expensive proposition, and it's been a hard sell. You know? So there's more and more interest in it, and if we eliminate the ROC1 inhibition, I think there'll be a lot more interest in it, but it's a very high-risk proposition. <clears throat> so what are, are there some other ways one can go about this? Well, what about using genetics and genomics as a tool to look at all the drugs that are out there and see if you can bring them into alcohol use disorder uh, using what's known about genes. So alcohol use disorder is a complex disease, and by that I mean it's a disease that has multiple risk genes associated with it, plus a very large environmental influence on it. Uh, and that's as opposed to a monogenic disease like Huntington's disease or phenylketonuria, which all babies are tested for, that is due to a single genetic defect. There's some environmental influence. You can treat PKU deficient children with diet, and they'll develop normally. So you can environmentally manipulate the system, but it's heavily genetically based. Alcohol use disorder is not. It's more like this. And if you go after individual genes as drug targets, you're probably going to have very small effect sizes unless you can select those people. So what about trying to go after multiple genes? So one way to do that is to try and get an idea of what genes are being expressed in the brain in control subjects or subjects who are at risk for alcohol, high alcohol drinking, or independent subjects. Because the genes that are being expressed are different in those three groups. And how can you do that? Well, you can look at the output of gene expression, which is ribonucleic acid. And so you can, there are ways now to actually extract RNA from cells, all the RNAs that are being produced by a cell, and sequence them all. Uh, we have the technologies now to do that. That used to be a very cumbersome process. And then you can look at them at two different states, let's say, and look at relative changes in gene expression. So these are four cell lines lined up vertically in these columns, the four again. But on the left, you have cells that are treated with a control solution. And on the right are cells treated with a steroid to induce changes in gene expression. And these are all, these are, you know, 20 genes or so. And you can see that they fall into two groups. The steroid treatment causes these guys to go up in red here and causes these guys to go down. So you can do these heat maps to look at relative changes in gene expression. So we've done a lot of this RNA analysis and sequencing. And um, this is work, a lot, a lot of this was done by Adrian Harris's lab and Dane Mayfield's lab at the, at the Wagner Center. And what kept popping up when, when we first looked at human samples, this was from a brain bank in Australia, these are frozen brains of alcoholics and matched controls, were genes that, that were overrepresented uh, in the immune and stress response. And at first, 
the first paper was around 2001, we thought that this might have been an artifact of contamination, blood contamination. But it kept popping up, and here's a paper in 2006, where you can see, you know, there, there are 11 genes that went up and 13 that went down. So this is very interesting because there are a lot of drugs being developed to modulate the immune response. <clears throat> and uh, you can even see this in animals. This is in mouse models of predisposition to high alcohol use. Uh, and this was a paper, this Mulligan paper in PNAS is sort of the landmark paper for this. These are animals that are alcohol naive but are known to drink a lot, inbred lines and, and selected lines. And so if you look at all these immune response uh, and stress response genes, that makes you think, well, gee, what, couldn't we just take a, off the shelf a bunch of molecules that are already known to manipulate these pathways and try them out? So that's what Yuri Blednov at the Wagner Center has done, and some of this is already published. But the interesting, most interesting ones he found is if he manipulates NF-kappa B signaling or phosphodiesterase 4 or uh, the, the PPAR uh, uh, agonist, so this is a transcription factor, all of these are anti-inflammatory drugs, and they decrease drinking in two-bottle choice models. Um, we've, we've chased some of these, and some of these drugs have side effects that make them never to be used in alcoholics, like they cause liver toxicity, or they've been pulled off the market for other reasons. This one, though, is very interesting. This is a premolast, which was recently approved to treat psoriasis, it's a, it, and it has uh, less side effects than other PDE4 inhibitors, which tend to cause nausea. This one's a little more selective uh, to the subtypes of PDE4 that are not involved in causing nausea. And so it's better tolerated. And uh, it does decrease drinking in mice pretty substantially. We've just published those papers uh, recently. And so there's a clinical trial going on through Barbara Mason's group at Scripps uh, La Jolla, where, again, these are non-treatment-seeking alcoholics, uh, heavy drinkers, who are <clears throat> testing this. And the, the data are not out yet, but people are tolerating the study, and she hasn't had a lot of dropout yet. Uh, that could be a very useful drug. Now, um, in addition to categorizing all the genes that are differentially expressed by what's known about their function, you know, they've been annotated in, in databases, um, one can also categorize or correlate genes based on the degree to which they are co-expressed, okay? So not every gene is known to do something. We don't know the function of all genes. But we can measure the amount of RNA that's produced at any amount of time and at least correlate the relative expression of the RNAs. And so we can capture more of the genome. And so uh, Dane's group uh, and Sean Ferris at the Wagner Center actually compared uh, levels of raw gene expression uh, versus uh, the connectivity in terms of co-expression networks between genes. So what you can do is you can develop a, a, a connectivity score for every single gene and cluster these genes into modules so you know that you, you have a score for this gene that it's connected to many, many other genes. So it has a high connectivity value. So if you take just raw gene expression and compare uh, control subjects and, and all the genes in, in alcoholic subjects, they pretty much line up on a, on, a, on a line and they correlate pretty well, but there is some scattered. You can see some genes scattered here in the basal lateral amygdala, the central nucleus of the amygdala, less so in the cortex and some in the nucleus accumbens. So there is some scatter and that allowed us to, to draw some conclusions, let's say, about immune response genes. But if you look at the, their connectivity with each other, if you compare these two uh, conditions, the, the alcoholic patients uh, have really disrupted connectivity uh, amongst genes. So even though their relative abundance hasn't changed, their co-expression factors have changed a lot. So there's something, and the idea is that genes that are expressed at similar amounts are probably functionally related. Because, you know, if you're going to build a car, you need, you know, all the parts that are needed for just that car. You don't need the parts for a motorcycle. And so all of the, the, those RNAs that are expressed at a relatively similar level are probably somewhat related. And actually, if you look at within these modules and you go back and look at the functional annotations that are in databases, you actually see that that's true. So that, that the connectivity does, does somewhat overlap with what's known about function. But this is a, a, a more unbiased approach, and it's terribly disrupted in alcohol dependence. And so that begs the question, can we actually look at an alcohol uh, 
dependence disrupted co-expression network and try and normalize it for the drug. And um, that's led us to use genomic data for drug repurpose. So that's the final part of the talk I want to get into, because I think this is really interesting. This is what I call systems pharmacology, and it's a newish approach uh, that is catching on. So, it, you know, it, it, people have talked about Moore's Law, where the number of transistors on a, on a, on a CPU have increased, have doubled every few years, right? And it keeps on getting bigger, faster, smarter, and cheaper. Well, there's something known as Aram's Law, where the number of drugs approved by the FDA have actually been falling as the cost has been going up every year. So we have the inverse situation. And this is really not sustainable to having any sort of drugs uh, coming out in the future. And it's extremely expensive to go all the way through from drug discovery to FDA approval. So expensive that a lot, there are a lot of compounds that have gone through preclinical and phase one safety testing that get hung up here and are sitting on the shelf of a variety of pharmaceutical companies. Some of these have been donated to the NIH and they're available for people to, to take and test in preclinical models. Um, so there have been a, there's been a real interest in trying to figure out methods to actually take these drugs and reposition them into other indications uh, that are not the ones they failed their clinical trials. And one way to do that is to use genomics. So this, uh, this is a paper that came out in Science in 2006. This is Eric Lander's group at the Broad Institute. And they proposed taking a biological state and get, getting a transcriptome signature, so a signature of the gene network in a disease state, and then comparing that with a database of drugs that have perturbed a similar network. And the way that's done is the Broad has taken a bunch of cell lines and treated them with a few thousand different drugs and categorized the transcriptional signatures on all those. And so you can query that database with your, if you can get a disease signature and look for the drug signature that is most opposite to this and try those drugs out. And so in a more simplified version, you have an addiction signature, you have a drug therapy, uh, you know, postulated drug therapy signature that's opposite. Hopefully this will correct that and you'll have less craving and more control. And so this is the Lynx data set. They actually use a thousand um, genes that are representative of the whole set of genes that they've categorized. They have almost 20,000 small molecules. Many of them are FDA approved drugs. And so uh, what we did is we developed a disease model in mice. We queried the database, prioritized some hits, tried them on mice to see if they worked. And this work was done by um, Igor Panomarev, who used a model that had been developed at Oregon Health Sciences University by John Crabb's lab. This is a uh, selected line of mice that have been selected over many drink generations to drink a lot of alcohol in a binge drinking protocol. And so after uh, about 30 selections, these mice drink a lot of alcohol in a very short period of time and have you know, more than 80 milligrams percent blood levels. And these mice are actually, you can get them, they're very resistant to naltrexone and other drugs. So what would be effective in treating them? So what they did is they, they uh, took uh, different brain regions, developed, trans, uh, uh, you know, measured the transcriptomes, came up with a transcriptome master signature for this HDID mouse, and these were naive mice by the time they did this. And then Laura Ferguson, who's now in my lab, did the Lynx analysis against the Lynx database. And what they pulled out was this compound called tyreic acid, which uh, nobody has ever really studied um, much. It's, uh, it's a product of, of a fungus, has a fairly simple structure. It inhibits this kinase, brutin tyrosine kinase, which has been involved in immune signaling and in cancer, and it would not have been picked up by deductive reasoning through what we already know. So this is an unbiased approach that led to this compound. So uh, John and uh, Angela Osborne at OHSU tested this in the HDID mice, and indeed the drug dose-dependently decreases drinking. When you get to the higher concentrations here, it also decreases water intake. But at other concentrations where it doesn't do that, it's effective. So this is a proof of concept that we're able to predict a compound out of this database and it actually works. Now this is not going to be a drug in humans, but it shows that, that the, the possibility exists. How am I doing on time? 
How many? Ten. I'm good. Okay. I wasn't sure because I, I didn't know how long you talked, right? So. Okay. So uh, I want to just make a, a couple of comments also about uh, difficulties in drug development. Uh, so what are the impediments to treatment? Well, you know, I already talked about the low effect size of the approved drugs. Uh, maybe the off-label drugs are a little bit stronger, but we need more data. Um, a big problem are, uh, that, that uh, clinical trialists talk about are the narrow uh, endpoints in, in randomized clinical trials as required by the FDA. And I'll talk about that. Also, AUD is a heterogeneous diagnosis, and, and Kenny really mentioned that, that the, uh, the, the DSM-5 criteria, are, you know, you can have people who fit two or three of different criteria and they still have the same diagnosis. Uh, very, uh, only a minority of people are treated. That's in part because people think it's a small effect size, in part because primary care providers that see many of these people don't know that much about the drugs. Uh, it's definitely because there's a social stigma. People don't even want to talk about it or they don't want to deal with it. And uh, there's this notion out there that the relapse rates are high anyway, so why bother? And I would just venture to say that those kind of relapse rates for a chronic di relapsing disorder are not that much different than diabetes or asthma or anything else, okay? So that, to me, is not an excuse. Now, something that, uh, as scientists, we might be able to handle are, are these two up here, and I just want to talk to you about it. Uh, first is uh, the FDA endpoints of abstinence or no heavy drinking days. They're very limiting and they're very dichotomous variables, in a, in a sense. They don't give you any kind of graded uh, 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 gradation. There's no, there's no room for the gray in here. And I'm, uh, like most of us scientists, we love the gray. Everything's a probability, a likelihood. So they're, in Europe, uh, they've adopted this uh, World Health Organization reduction in drink risk level. So uh, the WHO has defined four levels of, of drinking risk based on how much is drunk, both in men and women. And the idea is if you go one or two levels of drink risk uh, in response to a drug, that's considered a positive event. And so people have gone back and looked at topiramate, branicline, and naltrexone. And it looks like uh, going one risk level down is kind of noisy, but going two risk levels down from very high to medium or high to low uh, is actually quite robust. And you get a little bit more, you can capture more people as being positively affected. The numbers needed to treat to have a response are less, and you don't get that much increase in the placebo effect. So I think that th there's a group uh, of clinical trial experts in the country who are trying to get the FDA to adopt this. This would become kind of an international uh, benchmark. The other thing is uh, personalizing treatment. So there's been a lot of talk about using genetics to do that, but the problem is the effect size of any single gene is small, and it's not, to me, much of a surprise to think that it's kind of failed for alcohol use disorder. The biggest uh, push was for this variant of the new opioid receptor gene, and there were some initial papers that said it looked very promising, at least for predicting response to naltrexone, the opioid antagonist. But uh, more recent studies and larger numbers of people, that hasn't panned out. Um, and there was a pro prospective study, which I think is this one, that actually didn't see any signal. Um, there's been neuroimaging done in one study. So this is the PREDICT trial. It was a big treatment trial of naltrexone and acamprosate done in Europe and in four sites. And in one site, they also did um, uh, pre- and post-treatment uh, uh, functional MRI imaging. And they showed that there was that high Q-induced activation in the ventral striatum, which is the area of the nucleus accumbens, uh, predicted uh, uh, a better response to naltrexone. So that's sort of promising. So maybe there's a way to use imaging to stratify people. The, um, the, it, but, you know, it's this expensive, and primary care people can't necessarily do this. So what about behavioral phenotypes? And I talked about reward drinkers and relief drinkers. People have gone back and analyzed the PREDICT trial, the European trial, and the combined trial that was done in the U.S. many years ago and found that in this trial that naltrexone uh, had a better response in reward drinkers. This was a huge effect, an 83% reduction in heavy drinking. And in the combined trial, it appears that relief drinkers on acamprosate had reduced drinking days. So there may be a way to behaviorally phenotype people and stratify them. And so in summary, there's a need for better medications, 
It's a complex disorder. It probably would benefit from a systems pharmacology approach uh, with genomics. Drug repurposing may be the most cost-effective uh, uh, method or approach for now. Um, there's a move to expand uh, outcome measures in clinical trials, which I think is a positive thing. Um, it's important to remember it's a complex disorder with gene and environment interactions. And right now, with the, uh, the small and to modest effect size of the current therapies, it really has to be used, drug treatment has to be used as an adjunct to behavioral therapy and, uh, and also recovery interventions, which I think recovery interventions um, that have a, a, a social component to it, getting people involved in other groups, really help with this environmental interaction. And so these are just some people that I've had in my lab over the years who have participated in some of this work. And then I've, I, I'd like to thank funding from the Gallus Center, the State of California, UT Austin Startup Funds, the DOD, the Harrington Institute, the NIAAA, and also uh, my colleagues in the Wagner Center and the Neuroscience Graduate Program, and of course, rodents. All right, thanks. Sure. Questions? Sure. We can take a few questions while we're transitioning here. Yes. I think it, I think the use of MDMA and other psychedelics. I think it, the temptation is to get involved in it because of hypothesis and anecdotal evidence. Uh, I think it would need a real trial. Uh, you know, things have fallen out in trials. Um, but I think there's enough of an of a interesting signal to think it might work. Uh, one of the biggest ones that's, you know, historically is ibogaine, where people have gone to the Caribbean to use it. Uh, it's a little bit toxic. There's some uh, basic science evidence to, to say why it, how, how it might work. Um, it's worth a try. I, don't, I, I think it's a hard sell to get, to get that past, though. You know? I wouldn't, as a, uh, you know, you can't prescribe most of them anyway. So I'm not sure I would, I would recommend people doing that, but it's worth studying. Hi, I'm wondering how you uh, differentiate chemically or genetically the relief drinkers and the reward drinkers, how you identify um, them. That, that's a phenotype. That's a behavioral phenotype. It's not distinguished um, uh, genetically or, what did you say, chemically? Yeah, I mean, I don't know of any biomarkers that distinguish that. It's really just been a, um, a, a, a behavioral phenotype. It would be worth, I guess, doing that because it's, it's a, a subjective assessment of sorts by the investigator or the examiner. But I don't know of the data. There might be. I just don't know it. Yes. I don't think it would pass safety measures or efficacy. The very, you know, it's it's by the criteria that the FDA required, you know, in a clinical trial. I don't think it would pass. It, you know, it was it was approved long ago. You know. I do as well. Oh, well, that's a good question. I don't know what the status is on that. Do you know, Kenny? Well, it, why is it, why is disulfuram still being used if it's not really uh, you know shown in a, in clinical trials to be effective? Yes, uh, it's not my area of expertise, but I could tell you how I've seen it used. People believe it's very effective. It's when it's part of some kind of behavioral contact, and so. It's Keeping a family together, if the, the wife will stay with the husband if he agrees to pop a pill in front of her, you know, kind of a commitment to abstinence. And but in those kinds of cases, is it the drug that's being affected? Right, or is it or the is it the, the behavioral contract. contracting and the contingencies surrounding taking the drug? But at least the, in the situations I've seen it being used, 
you know, and people feel it's effective. It's not when it's just somebody taking on its own. It's part of a contract with a family member, with an employer, that sort of thing. Right, right. So, yeah. Wait, one more question. I would speak to that issue about when disulfiram is used. I think largely it's used by habit, that there's just not enough training with primary care doctors or psychiatrists about what else there is to use. Um, and so one of the things that I appreciated about your talk was at the beginning you said, well, these things aren't that effective. But then you talked about how complicated it is depending on what your goal is, what your end point is. And when you consider that alcohol use disorder very often does not occur alone, but actually occurs with other psychological disorders, mood disorders, bipolar disorder, um, anxiety disorders, sometimes moving people from um, high risk <laughs> to low risk, high risk to moderate risk, four drinks when you drink, two drinks when you drink, can make a huge impact on those other disorders that people have at the same time. So for those of us in the treatment community, one thing we struggle with is not being able to find the people to prescribe the naltrexone when we've seen it work with the, with the clients that do get it um, in these multiple, multiple ways other than just establishing abstinence. Right. Yeah. It, um, education of primary care providers is really a key thing, I think. And an organized effort towards that would be very helpful. Okay. All right, well, with that, we'll move on. Let's thank our speaker one more time, please. <laughs> <laughs>